Good evening and welcome to Festival of the Mind 2020 and our virtual Spiegel 10. My name's Dr. Nate Adams and I'm joined on our stage today with various collaborators and Professor Vanessa Tallman from the university as well who'll be chairing our Q&A session. But first, we are going to show you our film that we have created during lockdown. This is called Physical Education and it is a science circus exploration of what's going inside our cells and inside plant cells. So enjoy. beyond your imagination, where incredible things happen, invisible to you, but everywhere around you. I'm talking about photosynthesis, the process where water and carbon dioxide combine with sunlight to create oxygen and carbohydrate molecules. Life doesn't exist without it. We depend on it for the food we eat and the oxygen we breathe. Chlorophyll makes this happen, but chlorophyll doesn't just appear, as if by magic. Not really. I'm going to take you on a journey into the nano world of chaotic collisions that allow a plant or algae or even a bacteria to build a molecule of chlorophyll from scratch. Where what keeps our planet green and alive is powered by enzymes in a 16 step chemical process. But first, we've got to get to grips with how the planet scale process of photosynthesis is all happening at the nanoscale in a whole different, very small dimension. We'll begin with a leaf, the basic unit of photosynthesis we can see nature's solar panel. Give or take, this is about 10 centimeters. Let's start getting smaller. Part of it, one centimeter stem is 10 million nanometers. The new unit of measurement, turn it on its side and go 10 times smaller to the thinness of a leaf at 0.1 centimeters, one millimeter or a massive one million nanometers. Now let's go to the smallest thing we can see, the little hairs on the leaf. They're 100,000 nanometers. Now we've reached our human visual limit, let's really get into this plant. Now we're at the level we can't see without a microscope. At 10,000 nanometers is the size of a human cell, but we're not there, we're in a plant. We're in a palisade cell, squashed in with the chloroplasts. Think back, you might remember them from school. They're full of chlorophyll. We're now right in the powerhouse of photosynthesis in a space about 30,000 to 40,000 nanometers. This is the structure our incredible proteins move around in. Jumping down to their level. The nano world. We'll start with the viruses who are getting all the attention nowadays. At 100 nanometers, they're the start of this exciting new dimension, but we've got to go smaller still. 10 times smaller, and we're with the proteins. We can go 10 times smaller again to a molecule, but we'll stick here with the proteins. They're the ones that matter to this story. They're the movers and motors that make photosynthesis happen. This environment is incredibly frenetic, busy with proteins squishing past each other. Fortunately here, gravity doesn't matter anymore. We're not subject to it. There is very little friction and things move at super fast speeds. Proteins can take any shape they feel like taking, whatever gets the job done. When the job is moving molecules in the process of photosynthesis, this shape can be like a wedge, a duck, or a trowel. This world, with all its protein squishiness, doesn't just appear. It's all down to DNA. DNA. Ugh. Right, so I know DNA is important. It's the fundamental molecule of life, and it defines who you are. Modern biology places a lot of importance on that generic, I mean, genetic code. But for me, a human being is so much more than just a genetic code. It's a combination of thoughts, feelings, emotion, urges. And from a purely technical standpoint, fats, carbohydrates, and proteins swimming about in a load of water. You're effectively a walking, talking, sentient can of soup. DNA is apparently the recipe book for a human being, but that's not quite true. In fact, it's the instruction manual to produce proteins. 
and it's the proteins that go on to work or acquire all those other things like carbohydrates, fats, nucleotides, amino acids, micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, everything that you need to be a human being. Now that recipe book, that DNA, it does encode in terms of us a sentient can of soup. But with minor changes, you could then become a fern, a fish, a flatworm, a fungi, a ferret, and so on. This is what we rather gladly call the fundamental dogma of molecular biology, where you go from DNA to this stuff called RNA, which then becomes protein. Now, for our purposes, we can ignore this bit in the middle and just talk about the whole DNA going to protein. Let me explain. A piece of that genetic code exits the nucleus and it comes into contact with a rather large molecular machine. It's called a ribosome and it's gigantic, biologically speaking. This machine latches on, and what it does is it reads that genetic code, passing along the DNA, and out the other end, spits out a bit of protein. And then, when it's done, it pops off. But at this point, you've just got a long line of floppy protein. And everything in biology is defined by its shape. It needs to fold. Now, there are three basic shapes in biology. There's random floppy loop, which doesn't actually have a shape. Or there's a beautiful helix. And you probably will have seen that before with DNA. Or there's a third one in proteins. And that is called a sheet. These are long protective regions that sort of protect the inner cores. So folding is an incredible process. We don't really understand a lot of it. And to be honest, if we did, then we would live in a utopia. We would have unlimited medicine or the food that we'd need. But I don't know whether you've noticed we don't live in a utopia at the moment. Now, even with our best supercomputers, we can get like a vague idea. Now, we have other ways of getting pictures, but what the protein is doing is it's folding up, hiding all of its water-hating bits on the inside and keeping all the water-loving bits on the outside. What it's doing is it's hunting for its most energetically favorable confirmation. We call this falling into a thermodynamic well. And once we have a folded protein, then all the fun begins. Because this is biology, everything's a little bit squishy. And so, from one single fold or shape, the protein can actually change its conformation. Depending on whether it's really acidic outside or alkaline, whether it's really salty, or whether it's near hollow to fat. And that's because there's a lot of conformational flexibility. Oh, look, it's a rope. So for loads of proteins, this is where their story ends. They do something structural, they hang about in the cell, they do their thing. But there's a special type of protein that I want to talk about because that's what I work on. Now, life 
if you think about it, it's just loads and loads of chemical reactions happening, thousands of them happening within your cells. Loads of these reactions, they don't happen fast enough for life to survive. They need to be sped up, and this is where something amazing comes along, an enzyme. Enzymes are the catalysts of life. They speed up chemical reactions. Let me show you how. Let's just take any old random enzyme. It's probably just sort of hanging out, floating around in the cell, gently pulsating. Maybe it's a bit more excitable. And then suddenly, maybe something that it wants to bind to comes along, and it changes its conformation. It binds to it, and this enzyme will then act on it and do something to it. But when it's done, it will reset and then just float about in the cell again, doing its thing. I work on enzymes called molecular motors, and these are motors in the truest sense of the word. They take in a cellular fuel called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP for short, and they burn a chemical bond between phosphorus and oxygen. This produces something called chemomechanical motion, which is then transferred and then used to power a reaction. For example, muscle movement. But for this bit of the routine to work, uh, it's pretty hard to wear a microphone when you're not wearing any clothes, so I've had to use a bit of movie magic and my psychic powers to tell you the story. Muscle movement is powered by molecular motors. And within your cells is an amazing architecture, a cytoskeleton made from a protein called actin. For your muscles to do their thing, a molecular motor called myosin grabs onto this skeleton, takes some of that chemical fuel, adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, and then burns a phosphorus oxygen bond to produce a power stroke. And without molecular motors working consistently and precisely all the time, not only could I not move about in the air, I and you couldn't move at all. And what I find remarkable about all of this is that it's not just happening in me while I'm prattling about on this rope, but this is how all movement happens. And even when you're not moving, your enzymes are working, your molecular motors are doing things, your heart is constantly beating, your liver is removing toxins from your blood. This incredible dance occurring at the nanoscale within your cells is allowing you to survive and to thrive. These motors aren't just one thing. It's a bit more complicated than that. They're a collection of proteins operating cooperatively together. That's us. We build the planet's solar panels, pigment molecules. In nature, we are gorgeous, symmetrical, but random, and fabulous. A bit like this. In a lab setting, we have to be made synthetically. And Sniffing. for reasons yet unknown, things don't work out each time. Oh. Oh. Like that. Or this, this time, and this time. I'm CHLI, or I for short. I'm a motor which uses adenosine triphosphate to power a reaction. I take magnesium ion and put it into the porphyrin, but I don't do this alone. CHLD over here, you can call me D, forms a bridge between us and our other friend CHLH, who couldn't be here today due to COVID-19 working rules and social distancing regulations. H is my bit on the side and loves to play with my feet. Mm. But 
This protein over here is my main squeeze. Oh, fun. Our interaction is much stronger. Want to play with my feet later? Oh, do I have to? She always wants to have feet played with. Well, you can tell how much we like to hang out together because of our constant value. This measures the strength of our bonds with each other. Our constant value is really high. Play with my feet! Oh, fine. We have a nanomolar interaction. In fact, it's so strong, it's almost a pico level interaction. This means we're really hard to pull apart. It's because I like having my feet played with so much. So how much force exactly would it take to pull us apart? I mean, I think we're pretty strong. I think so too. Gunshot. do that, they had to figure out how to peek into our nano world. <gasps> Herbs! I know, right? There's a few different ways they could do this. But we couldn't remember all the acronyms, so... Oh, science crew! There is ITC, DSC, MST... <gasps> That's the one in which I get to spray you with water. No! And of course, there's the classic techniques like SPR or DSC or, you know, a good old fashioned native gel shift. It's not that hard. The team from Sheffield decided to use a technique called a fump fuck load. You want me to what now? It's what now. Oh, and we'll do that later. Look, atomic force microscopy, peak force quantitative nanomechanical mapping. Oh, of course, that's so obvious. Using some mirrors, a really sensitive camera, and some lasers, they can see the movement of the lasers reflecting off you as you vibrate. Wait, they can see that? Oh yes, baby. That means nothing to be ashamed of. Everyone does it. As we move, the cameras can pick up the change in vibration. The scientists managed to pull us apart. So what did they find out? How strong are we? And, drum roll please, the strength of interaction between I and D is... 110 piconewtons. Or 0 0.000000000011 newtons. doing double trapeze exert forces around four times their body weight, which in this case is 2,500 newtons, which is about 23 trillion times stronger than 110 piconewtons. But for two teeny tiny proteins squished inside the cell of a plant, literally powering all life on Earth, that's pretty good. I thought as much. I mean, look at us. We're boss. Gunshot, 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 gunshot. So that chlorophyll molecule, 
How does it all kick off? Chlorophyll is cool. It's the basis of all life. And without it, we wouldn't have this uh, fantastic atmosphere. Without it, our planet would be a lot more, well, tumbleweed. If you zoom right, right out and look at the Earth from space, using your special binoculars, It's blue, yes, but it's also really, really green. As green as a pea on a plate. And all that green is chlorophyll. Now, chlorophyll wasn't just kicking around waiting to become the basis of all life. Chlorophyll has to be made in a complex series of chemical reactions called the chlorophyll biosynthetic pathway. Every chemical reaction along the chlorophyll biosynthetic pathway has an enzyme to assist it. Now I think of this as a bit like how gravity helps us aerialists do what we do. Stay with me here. If I take the raw ingredients of this rope and my extremely muscular body, and I put them together in this combination. Then add a little gravity enzyme. This is what happens. Enzymes assist the process by putting everything together in the right place at the right time. Now, let's zoom back in again to the very beginning of the chlorophyll biosynthetic pathway. Stop it. Or what we like to call the basis of all life. Stop with the drama. Life begins with a <laughs> Turns out it's not God after all. He, she, they do not exist. Life begins when a <laughs> is inserted into a porphyrin molecule to make protoporphyrin 9. This innocent, squeaky-voiced little <laughs> is the basis of all life. But what about me? You don't exist. Now piss off, you're ruining my show. Where was I? This is a really difficult and inefficient process. And nature only worked out how to do this once. It's a unique combination. Before chlorophyll, life happened in a reducing atmosphere. But with photosynthesis, oxygen suddenly filled the air, killing everything off dead in the first great extinction event. This magic reaction that created something different has only been worked out once. It really is magic. Now, once the magnesium ion is inside the porphyrin molecule, it has to be held very, very carefully to prevent it absorbing light and producing radical oxygen, which we all know from our beauty products is really bad. This would damage the cell, ruining the whole shebang. It also has to go on to make chlorophyll. There's no going back. And just like how without gravity, that last aerial trick wouldn't have happened. Without an enzyme, this chemical reaction wouldn't happen. The enzyme involved is magnesium chelatase. Stop it. Magnesium from the metal it works with, chelatase from the Greek to capture. 
the enzyme helps the porphyrin capture the magnesium. Now, not much was previously known about magnesium chelatase, although it had been studied a lot. Particularly, we didn't know where the porphyrin bound inside the enzyme or how the magnesium ion got there. So it was time for some structure, function analysis. Mm. It's really juicy, that, isn't it? It really rolls around your tongue. The joy of structure, function analysis. In biology, everything is based on shape. If you can see the structure, you can work out what it does. Just like an aerial. If you can see the wrap that I'm doing, and the position of my body, you can work out exactly what's about to happen. Images were gained of magnesium chelatase. We could see its structure, but we still couldn't see where the porphyrin bound inside it. A different approach was needed. It was time for a bit of virtual reality. Computational docking was used. Now, I don't really know what that is. Apparently, you give the computer your enzyme structure and its cargo, which is porphyrin, and you ask it where it sits inside of it. While the computer did that, I went off and had a good time on my rope. The computer came back with an answer, which then needed testing. We used genetic modifications to test our theories and rack up loads of experiments, introducing mutations to test the theory. So, what is the structure? Porphyrin is a ring-shaped molecule, and inside of it there are two dangly bits. These are sticky. They are there to glue the porphyrin into the enzyme. Once it's in place, there are two bits that point from the outside world all the way into the centre of the porphyrin ring. Like they're there for something to be put into. Like they are waiting for something to arrive. Something like a magnesium ion, perhaps? One of them points from the bottom and one from the top. This is where we did all of our mutations. Now, when we mutated the bottom one, absolutely nothing happened. When we mutated the top one, it killed the protein instantly. Dead. That's how we knew it was quite important. We still needed more evidence, so we sent a crystallographer in to have a good look around. And she said she could see a channel that led directly from the centre of the porphyrin ring all the way to the outside world. A channel that the magnesium ion could enter through. It could slide in and take its place. So, Bearing in mind that even in science there are no absolute truths, this is what we now think happens in the dance of porphyrin and magnesium. Or, how I like to think about it, how to seduce a magnesium ion. <clears throat> Thank you.
The enzyme is floating around in the cell. The porphyrin molecule comes along and it takes its time to slide into place. Once it's there, the magnesium ion approaches. Come on. Come on. In order for the magnesium ion to get into the cell, the enzyme burns a load of cellular energy. Basically, having a big extravagant party with some of its friends to allow the magnesium ion to slide into place. Once it's there, in the middle of this blaze of glory, it's transformed. And magnesium protoporphyrin 9 is released. The beginning of new life. The enzyme, never satiated, floats off to do it all again. And thank you for joining us for a panel discussion about that quite remarkable film that we've just seen. Uh, I'm joined today with me from the virtual Spiegel tent. I am Professor Vanessa Torman, the director of the festival, and of interest for this discussion, a circus historian. And I have to say, I haven't seen quite, never seen quite such a remarkable collaboration between science and circus. So uh, I'm going to start the discussion by introducing you to the collaboration and the science and the artistry and the performers in this project. So first of all, can I pass over to my colleague, Dr. Nate Adams from the University of Sheffield. Hi, uh, yes, yeah, so my name's Dr. Nate Adams. I, I still am a practicing scientist, just about. I work in the lab in molecular biology and biotechnology, and my research focuses on the early stages of chlorophyll biosynthesis. So that's the story that Claire and Rebecca and Jess were telling in the story. But we also thought that it would be useful to have other introductory pieces in there. So that's why I did my little bit talking about the molecular, the fundamental dogma. And then we also had Samara doing the scales of photosynthesis. And also joining us with other people on this panel. So I've got Claire to my right. Should we go with Claire first? Yeah. Hi, I'm Claire. Um, I'm an analyst, rigger, um, circus theatre performer based in Sheffield. Um, We'll go for Rebecca. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm Rebecca. Um, I'm also an aerialist theatre maker uh, based in Sheffield. Uh, well, yeah, circus artist once upon a time, maybe, <laughs> still. Um, yeah, and it's been a wonderful pleasure to collaborate with you on a science project, Thank which you. has been very strange um, because, yeah, storytelling usually has hasn't been so real up until this point <laughs> so it's been great and of course i think it's really important to note that this was originally supposed to be a live event a cabaret with lots of people and drinking and frivolity but then the <laughs> pandemic happened so we had to bring in a filmmaker so i'm really pretty pleased to introduce our filmmaker who did everything edited filmed worked it out in terms of like how do we actually film this in a socially distanced way with one person on camera it's michalina kubiak Hi, yeah, I'm Michalina Kubiak, I'm a Sheffield-based filmmaker and yeah, Nate approached me about the project and I immediately was interested because circus and science, filming on ladders, just, you know, uh, couldn't resist so it's been really great to be part of the project and bring it to uh, Festival of the Mind. Great, well we've got some really great questions from the audience so I'm going to, well I'm going to start with two aspects really about the science because uh, as much as we love circus, we have to start looking at the research behind this. And um, so the first question really for you, Nay, is um, 
How did you decide which science topics to cover with your circus show? Uh, quite easily, they're my two favourite papers that I've written. I think that's how it worked out. So the work that Jess and Becca covered, um, that was where I got to invent the acronym FUM for FUCKNUM, you know. That's my favourite long one, because scientists do love a good long acronym. But it was also really fundamental, as it, it showed a whole new way of analysing how two proteins could interact at the nano level. Normally, when we look at a protein interaction, it's like taking a picture of thousands and thousands of molecules and averaging out you know, the bell curves. But this time, we were actually looking at individual molecules, individual proteins interacting with each other. And it took a lot of time, effort, and skill with both myself and my colleagues to do this work, and it told us some really fundamentally new things about the area. And then the second story was the one that Claire told, which has been accepted for publication. We were hoping it was going to be out by this point, but it takes a while. Uh, and that is the last five years of my life and the postdoc that I've been doing recently. So yeah, that was, that's what I asked them if they wanted to do, and they said yes. So. Very good. Um, Claire, uh, Becca, it would be interesting to know what was, what, can you tell us more about how the acts evolved? Did you actually choreograph the, the act yourself, or was it something that you worked with Nate on? What was the kind of evolution of the actual act or routine? Um, oh, I can start with that one. Um, so we, we originally got some videos from Nate where Nate dumbed down the science to uh, normal people level. <laughs> and then when we still didn't understand, we had some more uh, meetings with Nate where he tried to explain it with as many <laughs> different metaphors as he could possibly find. And, you know, we went back to the original videos, uh, tried to find some things that we could focus on. So for um, Jess and I, we, we were focusing on the interaction. So it's all about trying to find out the force between these two proteins and how much energy they can create. Um, and I mean, I'm still, I'm still okay. Yes, I'm still doing the science right, yes. Um, so <laughs> what, we, uh, what we were thinking about were really big power moves and how we could incorporate those into an act. Jess and I, though we were both aerialists individually, we haven't actually worked together as a duo act. So we had uh, about six weeks to um, be able to put together a trapeze, a doubles trapeze routine. Um, so it was in part uh, where we were trying to do choreography based on the science that we were given and in part just trying to do any moves that didn't kill us um <laughs> and we had we had like little keywords so as we as you heard in in the film we said that we were um that we were symmetrical so for the first section of the film we we just did symmetrical moves uh, where you could literally put a mirror down the middle of us and we would constantly be doing the same thing um so that's where how we developed our choreography and Claire, how did you develop, uh, you know, the beautiful chlorophyll <laughs> routine? I, I did like the green, uh, the, the base, you know, the, the, the green unsparkly outfit, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. And uh, I had to go with something green. And one of the hard things I always find is choosing a costume. But I saw, I kind of came across that online as like, yes, that's what it is. I need a, a green boiler suit, basically. Um, mm. But in terms of making the whole thing, so I took Nate's video and it took me quite a while to really understand what the story was. I guess that's what I was kind of looking for when I was mm. trying to make it. It's like, what, what part of this story am I going to tell and what, what's important here? Because there was a lot of scientific information even in the dumbed down Still version. Is. <laughs> Still <of the> research. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, which, which was quite challenging. And I guess when I make pieces of aerial with text, I'm normally just improvising around a subject, but, and I kind of was with this, but there were facts that I had to get in there. So um, I kind of did a, yeah, a combination of me riffing around the subject and drilling what the facts were, and then trying to find bits of action that would fit with those you know, bits of information and with that story, and, and yeah, find how I could physically tell that story. Nate was very hands-off with the whole thing, I have to say. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I mean, I think that's, that's what I've learned through all of this, especially with mentorship from Vanessa and everyone, is just let the creators do their thing and they'll produce something amazing. And they totally did 
So. But we, we do get a flash of your physical education skills as well, Nate, in the film, don't we? <laughs> That's because so, I'm a massive uh, lover. So one question we've got here is, uh, what is easier, biochemistry or aerial? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Good question. Well, I don't know. It's difficult because, uh, you know, I find biochemistry, I love my job and I love my work that I do in the lab, but it's taken a lot of practice and, you know, constant drilling, just like anything physical, to become green-fingered, as we say, able to do the experiments pretty easily. And to be an aerialist, I think you have to have the same level of dedication, passion, stupidity, um, of constantly drilling and constantly battling through what you, you get to a wall, you get to a plateau and you're training, you're like, no, I need to get better. So, so I think the same. So I love them both equally. Oh, very good. <laughs> And you suddenly were brought into this project because of the, the kind of pandemic. Yeah. Did you find the idea of doing this film, was it just so challenging or was it just an interesting collaboration that you embraced? It was both. I mean, uh, I didn't realise how challenging it would get until we got really close to uh, the, pro the actual filming. But uh, yeah, from the moment he approached me, I was very interested in the idea itself. And then as we started like, talking about it more, I was like, oh, this is going to be a very interesting challenge for me as well and uh, to really show them off and to show the science and to show their skill and uh, everything that they can do uh, with the constraints of time and um, actual the physical body as well because obviously we can't keep going forever with the shots. Um, but they've done an amazing job, honestly. They just smashed their routines every single time so it was really amazing and, and i suppose that's one of the questions we have is how long were you all working on the project and how did you adapt to creating the work under the pandemic situation um it was difficult to get fit i think because mm. obviously everything shut down in march and we couldn't access any spaces really so I, I mean, I walked in the first time when I got on the rope, I managed about five minutes, and then I was like, I'm tired now. I don't know, how did everyone else find it? <laughs> it? It was funny, though, and I think, I feel like this always happens to me, that I feel like I'm, I'm not fit enough and I'm not ready, and then when it comes to the day, suddenly I can do it, and, and you know, that's partly adrenaline, isn't it? But, um, yeah, thank God for adrenaline. Yeah, <laughs> but I think it, I also felt really out of the zone of performing because I hadn't performed at all this year mm. and that felt really challenging you know I was really really nervous whereas if you're on and off stages all the time you lose a little bit of that those nerves so that was a challenge. But that was also an interesting I mean you know uh, zooming and doing exercises in my bedroom is fine if you don't stay healthy but your performers you know your, your physical the physicality of circus is so intense so how did you all manage to kind of keep that level of fitness over the lockdown? We didn't. We didn't. We no. don't look it. You we look absolutely. amazing. <laughs> no, absolutely didn't because there wasn't... Uh, as much as you can do classes online, which I'm still doing, I, I think it was, it's very, very difficult. Um, Jess, who uh, can't be here because of social distancing rules, um, is currently starting her master's in sports psychology and she talks very eloquently about the idea of having a, uh, an identity with that's intertwined with circus and how you know one informs the other quite severely so without any reason to go and train you had to motivate yourself and if you didn't really want to you'd just be like yeah i'll train tomorrow <laughs> and Honestly, there was there was a lot of sourdough in the house. There was a lot of baking in the house. Like so much cake. we are, we are <laughs> as much as we are circus performers. We are also humans. So we went through the same pandemic. So none of us were quite the fitness levels that we were. And you know, Jess has done doubles before, but her base is significantly smaller than I am before the pandemic. And then the pandemic hit. So mm. she had to lift. You know, when we first got onto the trapeze, it was just reps of lifting each other mm. in order to get calluses back. We didn't have any calluses. <laughs> That's the other thing. We have calluses everywhere. Calluses on our hands. Thighs are particularly, like, sexy ones. Um, and Did you see the back of my knees in the film? You can see how bad <laughs> they are because I didn't have time to form the calluses I wanted to form. Well, I think you actually sent me a text saying that you were bleeding, <laughs> you know, and I had no sympathy, did I? <laughs> I had no sympathy at all. 
So, um, and you, you filmed in Victoria Works? Is that, it, look, it does look uh, quite beautiful where the filming was taking place. Is that where it was? Yes. Yeah. 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 And so, what prompted the idea from the film, other than the fact that you obviously have a desire to run off to the circus <laughs> night, you know? <laughs> Um, well, so, I mean, this, this was originally a very different project. This was originally, I mean, we, we got the initial seed funding from Victoria Works a year ago now for us to start exploring the idea of doing science communication in circus. But rather than it being all just the physics of circus, it was actually trying to tell stories. And I mean, this is a new line I'm using, using the metaphor of aerial to tell stories. So... And we had a completely different cast and crew. There were science communicators who circused from around the country that were coming together to build this. And so there's then, more people who are science communicators and circus. Yes, they, 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 they are secretly out there. There's a wow. mathematician in London who's a trapeze artist. There's a chemist who's a pole, lyrical pole artist. Um, Emily Sparks, who should be watching this, hopefully. She was originally very much part of the project. Um, she's trapeze and rope and everything, and she's a chemist. So there are scientists that do this and this is what we were creating and then it all changed and I remember emailing the festival going well this is all a bit interesting isn't it and so I got everyone else on a zoom call so I was like well let's pivot let's use that word pivot and let's pivot to something different let's make a film and let's use people from Sheffield because everyone was hurting by not having gigs and not performing and not having something to train for as Rebecca said so that's what I said, and I called it the Lockdown Passion Project. And then maybe you want to talk about that? Like, were you, were you happy with that pivot? Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. So um, Nate had talked to me about being a rigger for the project when it was originally going to be a live performance, and then when he got in touch and said, well, we're not doing it like that, we're going to make a film. Um, and I was there kind of going, well, are you going to ask me to be in it? <laughs> <laughs> and then he did, so I was really happy. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was great, and it was really, really lovely to have something unusual and interesting to work on in such a strange time, you know, and it, it felt like a good challenge, like a big challenge, but a good one. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the challenge, I mean, the other question, I think this must be from a physicist, why <laughs> did you choose, um, uh, so what part of science did you actually choose to cover with your circus show? Why is it all biology? Because you're a biologist. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean there's, there's, there's the rules of the Festival of the Mind where it has to be research focused as well. So that allowed us to focus very much on my research. So, yeah, a bit narcissistic, but, you know, <laughs> it felt like it was a good story. You know, it's an interesting story to tell, in my opinion. And I hope we did the story justice in how everyone communicated it. And also, yeah, it's not the physics of circus, it's not forces and friction, it's telling stories in a different way, as opposed to just showing the equipment off and what you can do with the equipment, because I think we've all done so much And stuff. so the, is that why you chose Circus, because you thought it gave you the, the breadth for the possibility, or was it just that you knew lots of science communicators who were circus performers? Well, people had, so that all comes from having done this originally at Cheltenham Science Festival, where I originally performed a silks act, and people in the science communication sector went, you need to do this more, you need to do this bigger, you need to do this in a different way and it is a really good thing so I gave it a try. But there are important questions that you kind of ask in the film and uh, do the, did the performers feel that they learned far more about the kind of importance of uh, and biology and the kind of process of life or were you just kind of compelled to translate this very difficult science into something that was... I mean I think because, because we actually wrote the scripts ourselves. We yeah. obviously had it checked several times. Um, but we wrote the scripts ourselves, so we had to understand mm. at least the section that we were working on. So it was, it was vital for us to understand the biology. So we would come in and we'd be like, Nate, can I pick your brain about this like very specific thing to do with his research? And I think that uh, to, to the physicist who has asked, like, very kind, but if we hadn't had Nate, who was specialised in this topic, <laughs> with us the whole time, I don't think that the science would have been right, because we were, we were still checking things the week of, just making sure that... On the day. Yeah, on, on the... I didn't want to say about that on the day, but yes, there was a moment on the day that we needed to check something, because it, it was... It, this, is, this is very 
uh, this is huge research, um, and it's groundbreaking research. So for us to, it, there isn't a YouTube video to dumb it down from the dumbed down version that you already <laughs> sent us. We don't we like to use the word dumbed down, we like to say I think, I think <laughs> what you're trying to say is not the kind of explanation that would be in a peer-reviewed journal read by the Academy, but something for the more general public. Yes, for people like myself. <laughs> <laughs> and even then, even watching it, having done, having seen all the videos, I'm still a bit like, do I understand all of that? <laughs> And I, I loved reading the papers. They were great papers. So we've, um, then I was going to ask this question. I think it's a really important one. How hard is it to deliver a monologue whilst performing aerial? Depends on who you are. Claire made it look extremely easy. <laughs> She's done a 14-minute routine, I think, and she was the first to go. And me and Nate were just not expecting it. And... I think a few times in the edit even, when she made a mistake, she did it so effortlessly that Nate had to be like, oh, this isn't right. But because she spoke so easily during her performance, I would just glaze over it because I was just <laughs> obsessed. But yeah, they've all done a fantastic job, but I have no idea how because I was there on the ladder being like tired just from standing. <laughs> so honestly, I don't know. Uh, there's some but, interesting things from it. So... A lot of it's the breathing as well. So yeah. when, when you're performing, or when, you, when you're not speaking but you're performing, your breathing is really carefully controlled to make sure you, you, know, you breathe out when you're inverting, when you're you know, using your abs and core and everything. But then suddenly you've got to speak while inverting. And, yeah, that's I thought, you sp I thought you all spoke beautifully, actually. It was very clear even if I didn't quite get some of the science involved. So, but I, there's quite a lot more questions. It's obviously got a lot of interest here. So to the performers, how many hours of training do you need to keep in performance condition? It's kind of like how long's a piece of string in a way, Ooh. isn't it, that one? But how many do you do, be honest? Um, so I think I do, although it's probably not quite right, four hours a day, five days a week. Uh, but that's including kind of warming up, conditioning, stretching. That's, you know, and I guess a bit of physio rehab, that kind of thing. Mm. But that probably keeps me a bit fitter and at a higher level than I really need to to perform. But that's the level I like to stick at. Okay. Becky, how long? Um, um, we, uh, so Jess and I were training four days a week for three hours per day, plus we do cardio twice a week, so going on runs and do extra fitness outside of that. So we were doing 12 hours of aerial per week, but we would do supplementary things mm -hmm. to help us keep fit. Um, for us, we were trying to build up um, calluses and mm -hmm. build up pain tolerance. So actually in reference to how do you breathe at the same time as doing um, uh, aerial, for us, we had to breathe whilst uh, bracing the pain. So I know when I said <laughs> a fum fum num, I was, I was purely in pain and trying to get through the word without screaming. <laughs> so. well, yeah, well, let's ask Nate, how many hours of aerial training do you do a week? Uh, so I'm probably about the same with Jess and Becca, so it's not, I'm not as hardcore as Claire, <laughs> but I'm sort of, yeah, 12 hours of aerial is good, and then, yeah, I do runs and cardio and yoga and pilates and all the other stuff that you have to do as well on the floor as well as doing the aerial conditioning and training well we've got a few more questions so um some of these are all about the next stage of the project really will there be any more of these i'm not sure if they mean the question and answer or the actual <laughs> show or more films but uh, explain these but will there be any more of these but what, I think the generic question is, what is next for this project? Uh, Do you see it being a kind of whole spectacular I, show? I, I am definitely working on something rather large and over the top in terms of a bid, which I've got to talk to you about at some point. Okay. <laughs> but um, I would like to perform this live. I don't know about you. Definitely, yeah. And Absolutely. would you like to tour, perform it? We should ask this person if they want to book you. <laughs> and, uh, Please. And how, how do you see its development? How do you see it developing? I suppose what they're saying, is it going to be like, COVID-19, the, the, you know, there's going to be a... Do you really want to go and see a show about that? No, <laughs> no, 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 I don't no. want to tell... Well, other scientists who might be in that area can tell us like a story about COVID-19, but, but not me. <laughs> mm. Is there something else about the film and the collaboration that you want to kind of talk about or just kind of explain that... The, 
I mean, out of the difficulties came something quite beautiful and interesting. So, is it was that kind of a, a surprise? I mean, Claire, you were a rigger, and now you're the the <laughs> kind of main character in the story in terms of the monologue. Um, Becky, were you surprised to be asked, or was you thinking this is a this is a <laughs> this is an oddball one? Yeah. Um, I, I think that Nate did a brilliant job of changing what he was given to adapt to the times. We obviously, uh, I think your original project was meant to be the first weekend of May. Yeah, yeah, no, we were supposed to be performing the first weekend of May and then in June and then for Festival of Mind and then also in November, so. So yeah, it was, it was a massive honor to be asked, but um, Nate very astutely predicted all the things <laughs> that, that have happened. He was like, there are going to be local lockdowns. There is not a chance I'm going to get everybody into the same space at the same time. So using Sheffield Performers was um, an absolutely brilliant call because something like this wouldn't have been possible. And very early on as well. I think yeah. actually... Mm -hmm. Nate being a microbiologist was a, was a really good point. <laughs> just, just in April going, let's anyone, anything happen, let's do it a different as, way. As, as our colleagues at the university say, it's not following science, it's following the right science. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, also, I so for personally, for me, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of what we achieved, considering the situation. I'm also really proud of working with everyone and what we did, because, you know, I've, I've always dreamed of working with you all. I, you know, I'm not an aerial performer. This is, this is like... You are, Nate, come on. <laughs> I'm getting there, and I'm really, you know, I, but, you know, I'm not, I'm nowhere near the level of skill of these people that I'm with, and I just... Well, yeah, no, just, you, it'll take you years. Yeah. But there's so much to aim for. Yeah, exactly, and I'm just really proud of what we did and, you know, how strong everyone became so quickly and worked so hard, and then Michalina coming in and just being like, right, we can film this. She made me book every single camera out of Creative Media. <laughs> Everything just in the back of my car. Mm. Just in case, just in case we're not missing it on the day. I was yeah. like, I was taking no chances of and not using this. And how difficult was it to record the sound as well? With the, that, that, yeah. that, that sounded to me, well, that felt to me that would have been the hardest thing. That was know? the hardest thing. That was the hardest challenge because not everybody could be mic'd up. Uh, mm. So when we could mic up Nate and Claire, the sound came out beautifully. But then we had to use, um, I attached uh, mics to cameras because also I couldn't use a boom mic because we had three shots going on at the same time, usually quite wide, so there's no way to get like a closer mm. uh, sound. So that was unfortunately something that I had to take a back seat so we can film them all and capture their beautiful performances and just try to figure it out in the edit. But that was, that was my, biggest, my biggest challenge, yeah. Uh, but I think I managed to salvage it <laughs> and make oh, it. And, and make I, it I think for everyone in the festival, but obviously for you, particularly when you're doing a live show with so many collaborators, it, it's been an amazing achievement from everyone involved in the festival, the performers, the collaborators, the artists, that we've managed to put so many amazing things on. And actually, Oh, and the festival team, just accepting all my random emails and missives going, I'm doing this now, please, if it's okay. Well, it's going to be okay, because we're going to do it. And then Lynette or Amy just going, yeah, go for it. You know. I think it's also important to, you know, that we, we go on, we carry on, and also that people get paid to do their yes. work and to show their professionalism. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah. this was all done, you know, it like... It, socialist circus show with everyone getting you know an equal share of the grant that we had and Victoria works are incredibly nice lovely by giving us the space for free to train and work in throughout this time so you know we're, we've been really blessed with that support and also I've got to say thank you to the biochemical society as well because they paid for me to learn to rope well I, I do hope you get the opportunity to do the show in different forms, but also the film again, because I, I think it was a really interesting creative collaboration. Um, and as somebody who does lots of creative stuff with circus, I hadn't really thought of doing circus and science. So it's a, it's a, I think circus is a great canvas for all a range of issues of the world. So I think it's really appropriate that a microbiologist has shown us that we can take it in this direction. So I'd like to thank you all for uh, watching the film. You can comment, you can come back and see it. It'll be on, as will this talk, on Festival of the Mind. And we uh, thank you for being part of the discussion, for all the many questions we have. And I apologise if I couldn't answer all of those questions, but the more scientific ones I'll pass on to Nate after, the, after we finish. <laughs>